So before we get into food law and policy, something a little kind of different for uh, the law faculty, uh, Sophocles and Antigone, I don't know how many of you uh, remember this from maybe high school English, um, it's a Greek tragedy, and a story of Antigone, um, the story tells of there was kind of there's a, a war and Antigone's brother died in battle and Creon having kind of won the war passes a rule about um, forbidding kind of ritual burials of those who, who lost. And he is really guided by the idea of the rule of law and constituting his new kind of newfound um, city. And Antigone is motivated by other kind of virtuous um, kind of responsibilities that the virtue of family loyalty. So she feels compelled to bury her brother before the burial rites, whereas Creon has forbid this. And so there's a real fight between the two of them. Um, and as is kind of often the case in Greek tragedies, there's no real solution to the conflict. Nothing gets resolved, but the conflict ends, usually with one or more people dying, and no one's really happy. There's been this really kind of big conflict, but nevertheless, often you'll have divine intervention, um, and the gods intervene to kind of end the conflict. They don't resolve it. It's not as though one virtue um, kind of becomes obsolete and the other one wins. It's just Sometimes in a particular situation, one virtue, kind of, there's a better choice in that particular situation, but you end up nevertheless with kind of conflict and tragedy because you can't actually always reconcile these different competing virtues. But we live in a society where we're kind of at different times compelled to follow different uh, kind of normative uh, imperatives. So I bring this example to food law and policy because I think that the idea of conflict is something that often we try to resolve, we try to kind of fix the problem, um, but as we know in many areas of regulatory intervention, many areas of law, it's not so easy to just kind of have a simple answer and then everything is fixed. There's always going to be messiness, there are always winners and losers, and it's important to be attentive to those kind of losers um, in relation to the winners in order to kind of to maintain um, a helpful dialogue for the future. And so when we think about these conflicts, it's really important to think about them being conflicts between competing virtues and not conflicts between right or wrong, right? If it's right and wrong, the outcome is obvious. You choose the right one and the wrong one, or if it's good or bad, you know what to do. But when we're confronted with conflicting virtues, the solution is not so obvious. And so you know, the Greek tragedies really encourage spectators in there to think about those conflicts in a way that and now we're, we're, we're moving in the way that we speak about things. This is the video that I wanted to show. Uh, we don't have sound. That's the from Portlandia, and I wanted to illustrate how food law and policy today is another example of tragedies um, and the idea of there being multiple conflicting interests at play. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Portlandia, the television show, and of those who know the show who has seen the chicken scene. For those who don't know, you know, you're in Portland, very 
kind of yuppie, hipster neighborhood, and you've got a couple who are in restaurants and they're asking for the menu, and they see that there's chicken on the menu, and they start asking all the you know, typical, you know, eye-rolling questions. Where is the chicken from? How is it raised? Was it humane? Um, you know, and kind of the standard questions that we actually start seeing people asking now become kind of obviously exaggerated for satire. They start asking the name of the chicken, and they want to know if the guy who can raise them is organic, like real organic, or actually has a business somewhere in New York and is just kind of owns this organic farm somewhere else. So it's just really connected to the to the land or just a business owner. So they ask all these questions and eventually they end up saying, well, we're just going to go visit the farm. We'll be right back. Um, they want to check out and see if the chicken has like his friends and all those different things. So it's funny, right? And you look at it and you laugh and you think it's ridiculous. What have we come to? I mean, it's one thing to want uh, kind of humane or ethical meat, but this is like an absurd kind of caricature of kind of where people are today. And yet, you know, in every joke, there's a little bit of truth. And the questions that are raised by the two clients at the restaurant are things that are really defining food law and policy as a discipline kind of over the past 10 years. And so the idea of labeling, uh, kind of humane, ethical labeling, organic labeling, these are kind of really kind of serious debates that are happening about what we can or cannot put on uh, food, how do you trust certification sources, um, the nature of the farmer, uh, who is this farmer? Is it kind of a big industrial operation or is it a small family farmer? Um, what motivates the farmer? Kind of the kind of rural economies and the way that we want to promote agricultural development in rural economies is a very real live issue. Um, the animal welfare perspective that they bring for the chickens, uh, this is something that's getting increasing attention. Uh, recently, Quebec has kind of been looking into changing animal welfare laws. And so this is, these are all things that are real. Of course, when you kind of put them all together and ask about the chickens' friends, it seems a bit absurd. But the idea of having kind of multiple interests in the nature of our food is actually not that strange. And it's actually been something that has been around for millennia. And we kind of don't only look at whether the calories of our food are sufficient. We don't only look to see whether the safety of our food is going to kind of ensure that we don't become violently ill within a couple of hours. We have a lot of different things that we think about when we make our food choices but not all of those are treated with the same importance um, as others. And so I am interested in the way some of these perspectives, again, here this was you know, a joke, but how some of these things become eye-rolling or not really the realm of regulation, like these are personal preferences, and what becomes you know, possibly the subject of regulation and what becomes um, rele relegated to the personal space. And so, what I think is interesting here is bringing kind of the idea of the Greek tragedy to food law and policy is to think, rather than looking at all these individual areas of intervention where law kind of regulates our relationship with food, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and food law and policy brings together people who are touching everything from autonomy and like libertarian perceptions of constitutional kind of rights in the United States and uh, trade regulations, tax kind of incentives for small businesses. I mean, it brings together a really varied group of people who don't necessarily speak the same language when they're actually working together because their interests and the purposes kind of that they're working towards are not necessarily aligned. But if we think of food law and policy as a space where conflicts between them can be explored, it's like a whole new way of understanding food law and policy. And so, I mean, the funny way of looking at it is in the Portlandia sketch, but kind of practically, um, earlier this month, I was in Halifax at the first food law and policy conference uh, to be held in Canada. And again, what you see in the presentations is there are different panels and different sections. Some people were speaking about food and agriculture and climate change. Others were speaking about food insecurity, um, kind of health law and obesity, and that was a separate kind of area of inquiry. And everyone has their own different area of uh, research. And one of the questions that was posed and was, in my mind, not sufficiently answered was, well, what, what is the price, what is the cost of pursuing um, kind of laws and regulations around soda taxes or other kind of health law initiatives? What are the implications of that on 
the work of your colleague who's more concerned about climate change and sustainable farming practices. Because you can't have everything, it's not all going to work. And so the ones who are concerned with ethical animal welfare and want pasture-raised meat are coming into conflict with those who are saying that pasture-raised you know, beef is actually the worst in terms of methane production. So there are conflicts that need to be resolved. And so often what happens is people speak about synergies between one or two. So you know, if we all switch to a meat kind of a plant-based diet, we'll solve the kind of grass-fed beef problem. But switching to a plant-based diet is maybe not going to address some of the right to food concerns that other people are concerned about when they're thinking about food on policy from a human rights perspective. And so there are conflicts, and to kind of push them under the table or to focus only on those places where there are kind of synergies and connections is again missing the point. And so if we step back, I mean, food on policy is still in like the early stages um, of, kind of, of its growth. It's been around for about 10 years. It's still kind of figuring out what it seeks to do. Um, and my perspective is that focusing on the conflicts and the spaces kind of where those conflicts can be negotiated is a more promising space for further scholarship than just kind of continue focusing on specific areas of intervention based on kind of your personal interest, whether it's labeling or welfare um, or from safety. So that's the idea of conflict. Now, to kind of take a break from that and food on policy today, I want to take a step back and kind of look at one particular area of food law policy that has historically been kind of the most <laughs> obvious of food laws and actually continues to be one of the most um, obvious food laws, and that's food safety regulations. Now, food safety regulations are kind of one of the few areas of intervention around food that actually use food in the title. So animal welfare laws are not food laws, they're about animal welfare. And the rights of workers on farms are kind of labor issues, not specifically about food. Food safety regulations are one of the few areas of food law policy that are explicitly about food, and so it's also normal that for many, many, many years, food law policy was kind of assumed to be food safety. Uh, kind of food and drug safety was what food law policy was, only now it kind of starting to expand, there's more to it. But if we looked at the origins of food safety regulations, we've had rules around food for millennia. Um, and we have had food uh, rules that date back to biblical times, that date back to the kind of Roman Empire and the Middle Ages. And for all of this time, food laws were connected to safety, but safety kind of perceived in a different way. And rather than speaking of safety, the language that was used was purity. And so purity is a word that is a little bit different from safety in that it has multiple meanings. And so there's a there's a kind of very descriptive plane of purities and pure from dirt and not dirty, but also a much more normative kind of weight to it. And purity was also about kind of virtuous behavior, eating properly, that kind of extends beyond kind of purely scientific. And so one of the first people to really write about this is Mary Douglas, who's an anthropologist who wrote uh, Purity and Danger. She was looking into kind of taboos uh, and conceptions of taboos and pollution in different communities. She spoke a lot about uh, laws of kashrut, the kosher regulations in the Jewish tradition, and how those could also be understood as not only about food safety and like the kind of well-being of those who are eating it, but also symbolic rules that kind of bind communities together and that define an identity uh, and relationship to an environment beyond the kind of purely what will make you sick and what won't make you sick. And so she started talking about purity um, kind of back in the very kind of early, early days. But then if you move forward, if you look kind of at how taboo and ritual in terms of purity shifted a little bit uh, to conceptions of adulteration. So the concerns around food were perhaps less symbolic around um, identity building, but were more about ensuring people were eating foods that they said they were. So concerns about people putting kind of sand or sawdust in, mixing that with flour to make bread, and that people would be unsuspecting in the market and buying things. And so kind of in the medieval times, start seeing rules around what can or can't go into food, and surveying that with the technology available at hand, which is limited, but there's an awareness of adulteration, concern about corruption, and you know, kind of 
ensuring the, the good behavior of merchants and protecting consumers. So there's kind of another kind of layer that kind of comes to food safety regulations. And then kind of to come much more recent, if you think about kind of the industrialization era, um, the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, when we see a really big shift in industrialization, in urbanization, kind of the methods of production have changed to the point where people are much more disconnected from their food than they ever were. They're not going to that kind of merchant who sells bread or sells beer. This is much more separated and there's a very kind of difficult a level of difficulty in ensuring kind of the quality of what you're buying. Um, and this really kind of became very public. I mean, many people in food law and policy, if you read any article about the origins of food law and policy, everyone refers to Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, um, which originally wasn't supposed to be about food at all. It was about the conditions of workers, kind of immigrant workers in Chicago stockyards. Um, but kind of unintentionally, in describing some of the practices that were going on in the stockyards and the contamination of food, that was kind of being prepared and set and sold, the public kind of reacted less to his socialist kind of call for help for the kind of working class and responded much more strongly to kind of the absolute terror at, that, at knowing that this is what they were eating. And so within a year of its pu publication, the US passed its first food safety laws. A year after the US, Canada passed our first food safety laws. Um, but again, this is still about you no know, concerns about um, corrupt or greedy or kind of you know bad uh, uh, bad kind of industry who were taking certain kind of cuts and corners at the expense of consumers and that's kind of where the food safety interventions come in is really to ensure that consumers were protected. But kind of as all this is happening, none of these are airtight containers and you know science and the kind of understanding of science and technology was relevant a thousand years ago, just as it is today, but kind of to varying degrees. But you do see an evolution of this conception of purity around food that slowly kind of loses the moral quality of around how food is a kind of part of society and it becomes more and more scientific, also as people become more disconnected from their food sources. And the technology just becomes so much more advanced that you can kind of check things that you couldn't check a thousand years ago. Um, so then if we come to today, around 100 years after the first wave of modern food safety regulations emerged in Canada and the US, so 1906-1907, we see kind of towards the end of the 1990s a new wave of concerns around food safety. Um, a lot of this has to do with the outbreaks of mad cow disease, um, but also kind of extends to hormone-treated beef. Uh, GM foods, these were all things that really ignited serious food scares among consumers. And the science of food safety came comes to play in a kind of different way in these conflicts than it did in the past and you know, really elevated the role of science kind of as the authority for food safety as opposed to other things. So after the first uh, outbreak of mad cow disease in Canada, there was a ban on Canadian beef exports to the US. Um, there was concern about contamination. But over the time, it seemed that the US was continuing to ban exports when there was no longer a scientific kind of proven risk that, the, that there would be contamination. And so it seemed that the reaction under the guise of food safety was actually a kind of protectionism in an attempt to protect American markets from Canadian beef. Um, and so kind of that exposes a whole level of where the conflict really plays around the science uh, of food safety and the abilities of states to regulate kind of food systems on the basis of whether or not it's according to science, um, scientifically sound principles. So Canada was constantly arguing with the United States that if there's no scientific basis to restrict imports, it was really just protectionism. And kind of a similar argument has been made for decades in the EU, where the EU has been resistant to hormone-treated beef, um, also to GM crops. And again, the argument is that there's no scientific principle on which that resistance can be based, and therefore trade restrictions are illegal and need to come to an end. So the, the article here that's uh, two years old talks about when there was 
a kind of new deal brokered between the EU and the US, which was the EU has always maintained that it does not want to import hormone treated beef, but kind of came to some agreement where it would import other high quality beef from North America to kind of balance out um, the restriction on, on hormone treated beef. Um, but what these really kind of point out is that whereas in the past, food safety regulations were really connected to a very local problem. And they kind of regulated the relationship of individuals and society and their relationship with food. Today, food safety is kind of very connected to a larger kind of practice of international trade. And it's become very difficult to disentangle the science of food safety with the policies and practices of international trade. So, the reason we're seeing this is because international trade, if we look at kind of how we work on an international market, it's important to kind of create common standards for everyone. So you don't want different countries um, kind of preferring their own products, you want to open the market, so there's a certain logic to that kind of liberal market. Um, but that requires a certain base standard. Um, and if we don't have community narratives around what constitutes good food, there, there has to be something. There has to be something if we're freely trading goods around the world. And science kind of offers uh, you know, a particularly attractive solution to this problem because in the absence of shared values, we have this you know, neutral, objective tool with which to regulate something. And we don't necessarily need to agree on everything, but as long as we follow the principles of sound science, kind of what you do elsewhere is your own business. But for the purposes of international trade, this is kind of where we can all agree. And that idea of using science in the service um, of international trade really kind of mirrors a trend towards kind of technocratic expertise, or here I refer to managerial expertise, that's a term um, that Alistair McIntyre uses, uh, to speak about the idea of, kind of decision making that tries to really shift away from more kind of value-based decision making towards um, like a very scientific and objective way of decision making that um, allows the decision maker to justify their kind of their policies on the basis of something other than their personal preference, um, and it kind of shields the, the decision makers from criticism because again this is seen as objective, it's neutral. Um, if a problem is with the science, it's not with the decision maker, so it makes things um, seem less, um, kind of less, so there's a conflict. And it's kind of based on the idea that you can actually separate facts and values from one another. And what it also does is it obscures conflict. So the way that facts and values interact with each other is actually kind of, that's where you see a lot of the conflicts and the kind of creation of conflicts. And by separating them and pushing values to um, kind of another realm, you're not really engaging with the complex. And so this is where you come back to the example from Portlandia, is where you go back to the example from Antigone. Uh, when you kind of distinguish the facts and values, all the kind of extra fluff that the consumers want in kind of the Portlandia scene, those are values. And no one is saying there's anything wrong with them, but those are certainly not the place where a regulatory intervention should be. Um, those are personal preferences, and where the regulatory intervention is, is just to ensure that the chicken on your plate is safe and is not contaminated with a certain public pollutants. But the personal preferences around what goes into them is not really for the policymaker, the decision maker, to be making those uh, preferences, those decisions. Um, but as kind of Antigone shows us, it's important to see where all these conflicts are because they really do play kind of on one another. And again, this goes back to the Halifax Conference on Food Policy. There are really serious implications for every kind of every uh, kind of entry point in food law policy has um, impacts on others. And so this is like a whack-a-mole kind of problem. You kind of deal with the environmental problem, but then that raises access problems. You deal with the access problem, but then that raises maybe some quality problems. And, um, kind of uh, income for farmers that becomes a problem. So then you deal with that. So I mean, you have constant conflicts and to focus exclusively on the scientific dimension of the safety is first of all kind of not acknowledging the whole conflict, but also kind of the second part of kind of McIntyre's critique of managerial expertise is that it's also not honest. 
And so again, in international trade, we're using food safety, um, or yeah, food safety, the science of that as the justification for certain policies, but this is in order to serve the goal of increasing international trade and exports of food across the world. And so that is the um, The way that we use science, science is a tool to be used um, for certain ends, but to suggest that that is kind of this objective basis upon which all decisions are made is not entirely honest either. So it's problematic because it obscures conflict, but it's also dishonest because it doesn't actually um, kind of acknowledge some of the political decisions or value judgments underlying many of these decisions. So the idea that kind of I am suggesting with the, the tragedies, with conflict, is that we need to reclaim tragedy as something desirable in food law and policy. Um, I think this is maybe something that could be appealing. I mean, law school is kind of something you want kind of clear answers, but of course, any law student knows that the second you walk in the door, there are no clear answers, and everything is complex, and everything, well, it could be this, or it could be this, and if you do this, there's ramifications down the road. And so food law and policy is not special in that way, and food law and policy needs to be just as open to conflict and to complexity that kind of all the other disciplines of law um, kind of already engage with. And so focusing on food safety suggests somehow that food safety regulations make food law and policy special, unique, that we can just focus on the science and that's it. But kind of, and for being really honest, we need to kind of acknowledge all of the complexities. So reclaiming strategy means that we're going to be left with difficult situations, and make difficult decisions. Um, it doesn't say what the decision should be, it doesn't suggest what a particular policy outcome should be, it doesn't say what the better choice is, but it does suggest that in making a certain decision or in preferring a particular policy outcome, um, in regulating in a certain way, we are maybe choosing one particular virtue or we're choosing one particular path, but we're still under the moral authority of the ones that we haven't chosen. So in the same way that the Greek tragedy doesn't end with family loyalty like, disappearing or the rule of law disappearing because one kind of, kind of one, one over the other at the end of the play, they're still there, they still are both competing rival goods. We need to think about food and policy in the same way that if something is safe, there might be certain costs, and we need to acknowledge those costs. It's not to say that a certain outcome is desirable, but we need to be very kind of explicit and kind of hiding from us in the science is suggesting that we're not acknowledging how we have moral authority, like the moral authority of other things. Um, and so, right, so I've never heard that like the kind of intervention, there may be a better or worse way to live through tragic confrontations. And that really just kind of contrasts with the idea of managerial expertise that kind of suggests and sometimes you can just balance, you kind of pick these baskets and you're kind of balancing one or the other, they're all equally good, you know, so this is, these are your values, that's good, this is the science, and this is good, um, and we're just gonna balance them. And the idea of reclaiming tragedy suggests that you can't just balance and pick one and say, well, they're both good options, but we chose this one and left that one. But to say that actually maybe this was a better choice and we have to be kind of explicit in acknowledging that it's better or worse and why. Um, so, Kind of to conclude, this is kind of the framework for kind of where I hope, I think, food law and policy can be heading, um, and it's the direction that I'm kind of planning to incorporate in my own work on the regulation of abattoirs and, uh, in Canada and the United States. Um, but the idea of bringing virtue of reclaiming tragedy into food law and policy is that we have to have really critical reflection on all these things. We can't just um, kind of focus on one area of intervention and ignore all the others. We need to be kind of aware and alive to that messiness. Um, and the idea of virtue, in, in particular, the reason why kind of virtue comes into the title of this presentation, why virtue comes into this project, is that there's a kind of there are many many virtues. If you look up virtue in the Oxford English Dictionary, you have hundreds, if not thousands, of kind of entries of what virtue can mean. Um, but there's one virtue that Aristotle uses um, that's connected to the Greek term phronesis, or good judgment. 
And that is a kind of, the virtue of practical wisdom or the virtue of good judgment is one that is very situated um, in a particular community, in a particular narrative. It recognizes that it cannot speak in universals. It can't make generalizable claims for everyone. Um, and it, it will kind of be constantly subject to change um, and kind of responsive in a way that kind of contrasts with the managerial tone. Um, and so for food lobby policy to be guided by good judgment, the idea of judgment is a bit more kind of willing to kind of work with that tragedy than um, managerialism. So uh, it doesn't eliminate conflict. I think that you can still see the kind of problems that come up with the couple in Portland that went to the restaurant. There's still going to be people who um, are winners and losers in any food system. But the idea of, kind of acknowledging those conflicts and creating a space where they can all be kind of conceived of together and debated together is a very different model for conceiving of food on policy than kind of having them in two silos where they'll never end up kind of in conversation and are kind of less able to respond to each other's arguments and to change um, over time. And so the last slide, just to kind of maybe get you thinking, Again, just kind of beyond the science of food safety and how again situated knowledge is so important for food line policy moving forward. Um, on the left, you have a, kind of an Italian delicacy. It's a Sardinian cheese that uh, contains live maggots. And I've never tried it, but people love it. It's one of like, the most favorite dishes in Sardinia. Um, and so, Kind of the narrative and the community within which that is deemed not only kind of safe but desirable um, is very different from this kind of public service announcement from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, that kind of had a whole campaign last year that was called "When in Doubt, Throw It Out," and all kinds of pictures of you know bruised apples and. The Tupperware container, so I mean, these are perceptions of safety that obviously kind of vary and are on very different ends of the spectrum and come from countries that, you know, have similar levels of scientific knowledge. This is not a question of, you know, discrepancies in terms of access to knowledge and access to scientific information. There's a question of values, and kind of this should be thrown into kind of a challenging some of the perceptions that the science of food safety could be an objective uh, kind of way of, of regulating our food. So with these pictures, I will come back up. For some strange reason, the word delicacy is forever associated in my mind with gross food. I don't know why. <laughs> Euh, moi, je vais commencer en français, qui va justement euh, respecter le, le, le mandat de euh, Je commencerai par dire, Sarah, que euh, donc Sarah m'a envoyé euh, euh, ces neuf contenus que je mettrai par euh, pour, pour, pour aujourd'hui. Puis euh, j'ai vu dans les textes que tu m'as envoyé euh, un engagement très sincère et très critique avec ton sujet. Euh, puis c est, c est, ça a été très agréable à nous. Euh, c'est agréable, d'autant plus qu'il euh, ne reste pas beaucoup de temps ici. C'est le fun de voir euh, les étudiants euh, euh, au doctorat qui, 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 qui font euh, un travail que je trouve vraiment bien et euh, intéressant. Euh, surtout que moi, je suis un, 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 je suis un, un fan de, 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 de l'histoire, de l'humanité, que tu m'avais garanti euh, Donc, merci, euh, merci pour ta présentation. Uh, to come I'd start with a general question and then a general challenge. Um, the general question is a bit hard because it, it, it speaks to your, your not, not necessarily hard to answer, but let's say hard to answer in a few words, because it speaks to your conception of what law is for you. And I would like to know what do you think is the essence of the role of law? towards food, without any reference to uh, uh, the school of thought that it might end up reflecting as 
uh, managerialism, technocracy, or now the food movement, but whatever the values that end, that end up in, uh, uh, in the law, c'est quoi le rôle du droit par rapport à la nourriture? Non, je vais laisser euh, euh, répondre à ça, puis après ça, je vais on, on passer à le truc qui, qui est venu. Euh, je vais commencer en français, puis ça se peut que je vais changer dans la mesure. Mais pour moi, le rôle de, du droit dans l'aliment, c'est premièrement de distinguer entre l'aliment en tant que tel et notre relation avec notre alimentation. Alors, en fait, pour moi, le rôle du droit, c'est de créer des, des possibilités pour développer ou maintenir notre relation avec l'alimentation versus un droit qui se préoccupe avec l'aliment en tant que, que bien. So, the idea is that the role of law is to kind of to shape and guide and support um, kind of our relationship with food and with the narratives through which we understand our relationship to food. And it's not so much to intervene in, kind of, in food as a commodity itself. And so, I'm not sure if this entirely answers your question, but it's something that I've been thinking about um, recently because if you think about food as a commodity, then kind of the area of intervention of law will be kind of a certain kind. And think about food as more as a, a site where kind of different relationships or actions and actors can interact, the role of law is a bit different. So, I'm worried that I'm not fully answering your question, so I think I'm speaking more about what you know, the importance of how food is understood and not the law's response to it. But there is a distinction between <coughs> law supporting um, or being part of being part of a system in which food is also found and law kind of acting on food as a commodity. Mais, mais en l'enfance, des, des, euh, une distance qui demande toujours, une distance physique entre le consommateur puis la, où est-ce que la nourriture est produite. Puis après, il y a aussi une distance politique entre les préoccupations du consommateur et les préoccupations des, des gens qui prennent des décisions par rapport à, par rapport à la nourriture, comme par exemple la dégradation des marchés. Puis la réponse un peu pour conseiller tout ça que les gens sont amenés, c'est bon, ben, si on, on va on va se fonder sur la science, qui crée nécessairement aussi une distance intellectuelle entre le consommateur et le professionnel, l'expert. So, are you sort of telling us there's a rival good within the policy choice itself, in the sense that the more we get closer to the food through a scientific approach, the more we further distance ourselves from the person eating it? And isn't that also a conflict that should be part of that conflict-centered uh, approach to food regulation. Um, yeah, actually, that's, that's, that's a great observation that I hadn't thought about that the more you know, as science has evolved, we know more about food, and we protect more and more from it. We become more and more distanced from it. Um, so, I mean, I, I agree with that, because I mean, that's kind of also the, the historical path that I'm tracing. Um, but what I also noticed, and, didn't have a, didn't speak about it in my presentation, but this is kind of where my empirical work in case studies will be bringing me kind of in the coming year. Is despite this trend towards the scientization of food, there's still spaces where kind of the community narrative actually exists, and so the science is evolving, and we're knowing more and more and more. But there are still communities where, in spite of that. Um, they're still able and willing to kind of, to regulate food differently, and so I think this might I mean, you might have seen this from what I circulated, but other people have benefited of seeing it. Um, I mean, if you the case that I, what I'm looking at is Ontario, Quebec, and Vermont, right? So these are three jurisdictions that have, in the same way that I showed Italy and Canada, Ontario, Quebec, and Vermont have the same capacity to kind of ensure the safety of food, and they have the same monitoring capabilities. You know, Budgets may be different, but for all intents and purposes, they can all study the science of the food in the same way. And yet, the reaction, the responses to the different systems 
are different. And so there is not an inevitable kind of one-way path. The question to me that's interesting is how do some communities maintain that more connected, unscientific relationship with food while others do not. Um, and then the other thing that I think is also problematic is even the way that we frame it in terms of it's kind of scientific and non-scientific. And so even it's like the science, anti-science, and kind of there's not so much nuance in between. Um, is that yeah. kind of respond to it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, but that point of view, it's an solution alternative. Um, tu dis que uh, les, les, uh, on, malheureusement, on n'est pas comme dans une tragédie grecque, on n'a pas d'intervention du milieu. Euh, mais je serais en désaccord avec ça. There is a God. Its name is legislator. Puis le, 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 le législateur est, est d'autant plus, son intervention est d'autant plus précieuse dans une situation où est-ce qu'on a. On a, on a, on a une situation qui est très relativiste, très pluraliste. Uh, and life needs to go on. Uh, food needs to be regulated. Et puis il n'y a pas de consensus, mais en attendant un consensus, the legislator comes in, and it might be a, 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 it might be a very frustrating intervention, but we need it. And the virtue of that intervention is that it is irrational. It is not rational at all. The reason why you obey the law has nothing to do with whether it's right or wrong. It's just in en attendant qu'on est mieux. Donc est-ce que euh, euh, c'est pas tant une question de réarmement critique, mais de de, 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 de se recentrer sur une conception peut-être plus euh, euh, autoritative du droit, qui serait une solution qui n'est pas extraordinaire, mais qui, qui, qui permet de manger plus. Euh, mais je suis pas en désaccord avec l'idée qu'on a une intervention divine sous la forme de législation. Euh, je pense que justement, c'est pour euh, mettre fin à un conflit pour pouvoir avancer. Mais la différence euh, que je vois quand même avec l'intervention divine dans les tragédies grecques et ce qu'on a maintenant, c'est l'idée que comme la tragédie, ça, ça termine, mais la prochaine fois, le conflit peut être, on va le résoudre de la manière, de manière inverse. C'est toujours la même chose. Alors, les, les, euh, les Greek Gods, ils vont intervenir, mais ça peut, ça peut toujours changer. Et puis, je pense que ce changement est peut-être plus l'idée de « good judgment » qu'une solution qui se voit comme étant neutre ou objective, comme si on avait trouvé la, la réponse. Alors, en tant que la législation admet qu'il y a des conflits, admet que c'est la solution la plus juste qu'on a trouvée pour l'instant, et on comprend qu'il faut avoir quelque chose, pour ça prend des règles, mais on, on, on comprend qu'il y a des, des, des gens qui sont en désaccord. Là, c'est justement la sorte de législation qu'on qu recherche, mais ce qu'on ne recherche pas, c'est quand on nous dit qu'il n'y avait même pas eu de conflit. Mm -hmm. Quand on voit le rôle de, de la législation comme juste reproduire la science, comme si c'était neutre, comme s'il n'y avait pas de conflit, comme s'il n'y avait pas de gens qui perdent, ce n'est pas une intervention dans une tragédie. C'est autre chose. Alors, c'est comme ça, comment on perçoit cette législation, mais en tant que ça peut bouger, ça peut changer, ça voit que comme ce qui se passe dans, comme dans une région peut varier à une autre. C'est sûr que d'un jour à l'autre, c'est impossible parce qu'on peut quand même avoir une certaine « predictability » et « stability » dans nos lois. Mais quand même, de prendre conscience du fait que ça, ça peut changer, ça peut évoluer, que c'est rédigé en fonction de plusieurs intérêts et pas juste de une chose. Ou de dire que c'est à cause d'une chose, la science, quand on sait vraiment que c'est plein d'intérêts en dessous. Alors c'est plus d'être plus euh, ouvert et honnête avec l'engagement de cette intervention divine euh, au lieu de dire que ça existait pas tout.